Welcome viewers to the ninth episode of Beyond Phrenology. We have with us today uh, Professor Tatsushi Nonaka from Kobe University, Japan. Uh, Professor Nonaka runs uh, uh, an eco psych lab, uh, highly focused on the, the, the learning of skills in young children, given that he is in the Department of Education. Uh, has been very prolific ecological scientist. Uh, Professor Nonaka has published some really nice papers, especially in the context of real-world skills. For instance, uh, stone napping, uh, making potteries, as well as uh, spoon use in children. And he comes up, he comes with a unique perspective on uh, skill development, uh, very ecological in approach, uh, looking at how individuals, when they uh, work on a entity, for instance, a potter starts working on a pottery like a like a lump of clay which finally the potter gives its shape, how the potter's individual characteristics, for instance, the, the shape of the hand uh, or the cultural learning gets embodied into those uh, uh, end products. And what we can infer uh, looking at artifacts uh, about the skill of individual, about their morphology, about their culture uh, and, and dimensions uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the maker. So Professor Nunaka, welcome to Beyond Phrenology. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And thank you very much for invitation. I mean, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, so, Professor Nanaka, we would love to know a little more about what's going on in your lab. And uh, uh, we want to delve a little into ecological psychology for viewers who are not familiar with what this approach is, what exactly is the end goal of ecological psychology, and uh, what's the enterprise uh, we are. Uh, okay, so, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the... To me, the the sort of the central question of ecological psychology is how do uh, agents, including humans, control their ongoing encounters with the environment, and you know what what are the processes by which uh, agents are coupled to specific aspects of the environment, which constitute their you know habits of life. So and. I think um, in order to understand what an agent is doing uh, in the environment, it's not enough to just look uh, at the, the agent itself and its inside mechanism, but you also have to understand the aspect of the environment that the behavior of agent is coupled to, uh, which, which can include like other organisms, including humans. For example, if you if you want to um, understand what a tennis player is doing, uh, you cannot just you know if you're just looking at the the, the player himself, it's very, very difficult to understand if you uh, you know not looking at the other player. Yeah. So you know that understand you know the the behavior of one tennis player, you necessarily have to understand the the what other player is player is doing. So. Which is like uh, kind of like so you, to understand the behavior of an agent, you have to kind of understand what the the behavior of agent is uh, dealing with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's to me that's the kind of um, the sort of perspective of ecological approach. So, uh, so is it like so traditionally we have been looking at agents generally, right? Uh, for instance. A lot of the neuroscience, uh, we normally put people in the scanner, right? Uh, a lot of those tasks are extremely isolated or uh, like the components of like a longer, uh, you know, or a, or a bigger time skill. So do you mean to say that uh, it's important for us to understand any real world behavior, or real world skill to study the agent as it is situated in the task context? Something, something of that sort. Yeah, and so I do not, you know, uh, mean that the the kind of approach that looks, you know, like I do not deny neuroscience or anything. So um, I think to understand uh, what humor is doing, yeah, it's it's important. It's it's important to have the knowledge of the the what's going on inside the brain and stuff. But it it's also important to have the idea. What uh, what kind of the environment which we are sort of embedded in, and we are um, it's it's 
you know, a different time scale in like evolution, during evolution, we kind of, uh, our behavior evolved in such a way to use specific resources of the environment yeah. and in development as well. So we have to, uh, you know, one approach to understand our behavior is to look at the, the coupling between environment and the agents. So could you give a little example uh, on that note? Yeah, for example, um, for example, let's say like walking. You can you can think of walking. You can look at walking as a way of moving your limbs in a particular manner. Yeah. But uh, if you look at the the you know infants walking, they walk very differently from adults. Right. They do. So what kind of give rise to the development? To answer this question, you have to uh, kind of um, understand the environment. So the in, like studies on like for example gate initiation from stance. Uh, there are French uh, biomechanists Yvonne Breniel and you know, Blandin Brill. They showed how you know you have to use gravity in order to uh, sort of uh, get propulsive force from the stationary stance. Without gravity, it's not it's impossible. Yeah, and so you're kind of harnessing the properties of the environment in such a way to propel forward. And it's not just the gravity, for example, um, French anthropologist, Marcel Mauss, he, he was saying you know, things like, people walk differently in different countries and men and women walk differently in some society. So, their manner of walking is somehow adjusted to some kind of norms in the society, which is also uh, kind of the influence of the environment that shapes the, the right. manners of walking. Right. You know, that makes complete sense. Right. So, so given now, so, I mean, so isn't it like, if, if it's so contextual, in that case, what exactly are we coming at? So, you know, one can argue that if we are looking at environmental specificity or relationship with different environmental factors, which themselves are variable, then what exactly is the ground truth about the physiology or about cognition or or any developmental aspect are we, uh, are we able to understand, given that it is so context dependent? Uh, what do you mean by the, the, the ground so, truth? So if we, if we bring... The whole idea of non-ecological approaches is, is uh, so basically we do not consider the environment and we look at the individual, you know, in isolation. But as you bring in environment, you also bring in environmental contingencies, right? For instance, in this case, the cross-cultural context of walking. So once we have that as well as you know in the play, then uh, what we learn about an organism is is nothing specific to organism. It is specific to the organism and environment, right? So it creates a lot of subjectivity and uh, nuance to the explanations of what behavior we are looking at, right? Uh -huh. So, 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 isn't that a criticism of the ecological approach? Like, I mean, in that case, where are like where is the approach leading towards? Okay. Uh, so, okay. So, yeah. Let's. For example, let's think about like learning of skill. If you um, characterize uh, learning of skill as, for example, like cultural skill, like like pottery and stuff, and if you uh, sort of characterize this learning of skill, trans transmission of skill as passing of some kind of discrete inform, some kind of information yeah. from your from your you know. I don't know. It's from your brain to you know the 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 mind of the learners or something, and so if if that's the case, the I don't know the skill. If if the skill consists of dealing with the dynamic environment, yeah then the the sort of the knowledge of someone else 
experience may not work at your situation in your right, situation. Right, 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 right. So, and you can empirically test this idea and test this idea. So, we did one study in that looks into the the kind of how potters make the the you know their pottery, and so if you if this learning of skill consists of imitating yeah. one's behavior exactly like you know faithfully sort of imitating the the behavior itself yeah then and uh, then the sort of the variation of the end product yeah and the variation of the process yeah should, should match more, yeah it should match right yeah between the the, the participants right right but when we looked up into when we looked into the 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 process of you know formation and also the end product the end product is much less variable compared to the 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 process of um uh, shaping the 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 pot shaping okay. the vessels yeah that means that uh you're not exactly you know imitating the behavior itself but you're kind of uh adjusting on the fly to your kind of particular situation in the environment. So the learning of skill is not exactly, you know, not like faithfully sort of copying someone else's behavior. Yeah. But it's more like um it's more like um learning to attend to certain important aspects of the dynamic environment. Right. 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 Yeah. So this kind of like you know shifting of perspective that I think ecological psychology brings. Right. So so does it does it mean that uh, uh, a lot of these skills like complex skills uh, which come out of tradition or which involves a long learning time, for instance, you know, a bead uh, uh, making beads or napping stones or you know uh, pottery or 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 very traditional or cultural skills, does it mean that they cannot be written down in sequences of steps, you know, and kept it across generations and transferred, you need to have a continuum of like real human hands. Uh, and it will be hard, like if they, if there's a discontinuity uh, to, to I think so. Them. so uh, I think, I think so. If, uh, unless you have similar skills already, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. For example, if you have already practiced pottery. Yeah. And some kind of, uh, you know, unfamiliar shape of pot is introduced. Probably you can reproduce the the you know the shape of the pot. But if you haven't, um, if you have completely, uh, yeah, it, it would be difficult to sort of. Um, The education of attention to relevant aspects of the environment uh, it would be uh, difficult to learn without the the other person around i think right yeah. is that the question no it, it, it partially answers that okay so let me uh, let me let me let me ask yep, it a, yep. another way yeah uh okay so in in an ecological context how would a teacher know that the learner is actually learning given that the learner will have variation based on the in the process, right? Much more in the process, a lot more variation. So how? Mm -hmm. So what are the cues would would, would a teacher know that actually the learning process take, is taking place, or whether the learning process is taking place really well or not? Given that there's so much availability in the learning process itself. Mm. So you mean how the teachers, how the, yeah. the you know teacher knows about the, yeah. the progress of the 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 learner. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, in a skill like that, without um, I mean, unless the teacher looks at the end product. Uh, okay, so yeah. um, I have another example of handwriting. Yeah. So. So I studied um, the children who first started to you know write the yeah. letters in in Japan. Hmm. So. And these letters are much more complex than English alphabets, right? Or well, in some of the languages. 
Well, it's um, it's a. I don't know if it's more complex or not, but it's it's okay. quite different. Yeah. yeah, and so it's very um. Uh, uh, it's very motoric. It it has certain motor kind yeah. of function. So you distinguish the the letters by kind of the the uh, underlying movement that produce the letter. So. Uh, for example, um, when you write a stroke in, in Japanese, like letter, how to end the stroke, the, the ending of the, the line, yeah. matters very much. And you have to, uh, there are basically like three ways to end the stroke. And you have to uh, distinguish the, the sort of uh, ending, how you end the stroke to make the letter more legible. Okay. And so probably the, the what teacher does is very much emphasize the, the, the you know ending of the, the stroke during okay. the class. And you know the teacher can look at the, the sort of end of product, the, the written letters uh, written by children, and probably they can tell you know if they are attuned to relevant. Yeah. aspects of the, the sort of movement of writing the letter. So it's it's more like uh, sort of tuning of attention, I think, which teachers care about. I see. And this this is in like nursery and preschool. Yeah, it's it's the first year of primary school. For sure. So yeah. So so are there are there uh, uh, students who are not able to learn right? Uh, these let are there are there students who have extreme difficulty in 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 writing these letters and emphasizing the end of those? Like are there oh, students who they... are there students who have very uh, who face difficulties in actually writing these these alphabets Japanese alphabets? Uh, you mean uh, are there children who who have difficulty in writing yeah. these letters? Yes. Um. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. But usually, um, by the time they enter primary school, they have experience with the you know picture books and everything, so they kind of know how to produce the shape of the letter. Yeah. Uh, but uh, after they you know start officially learning the letter, their their movement drastically changes. So the shape of the letter does not seem to you know change very much right. except the details but the movement really uh, drastically changed after they start like official learn, you know writing education i see yeah okay no that is, that that explains yeah so so how so how is the ecological approach more relevant to you know understanding for instance in this case you know uh, the learning of writing the alphabets like Compared okay, to other, uh, uh, compared to other approaches, uh, which invoke more like internal models or more, you know, like, uh, motor programs, for instance. Mm, yeah. Uh, so, so the manner, um, the skill of uh, handwriting has been discussed in the literature. Um, so it has been that the. It's a development of like fine uh, motor uh, skill. Yeah. So the the you know development of dexterity, dexterity of you know fingers and you know controlling the the um, fine movement. Yeah. Which is partly true, but um, but if you focus on this aspect, uh, you do not. No, for example, you cannot uh, describe the the uh, development so, so certain path of development towards the norms uh, that is shared in the environment, right? So it's not just uh, the development of fine motor skills in isolation, but which uh, kind of the development is itself uh, directed towards certain 
uh, how to say, yeah. Certain values uh, yeah. that so, so certain you know uh, purposes that, that serves in the environment. So if you kind of focused on just the development of fine motor skills, or I don't know the the something like um, representation of letters or something. Yes. Uh, you you do not um, kind of. Uh, you do not ask this aspect of question. You 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 um, overlook this aspect of development. No, I I I see that. So so which means that you know like if we if we test people on standard battery of fine motor skill, for instance, you know like fits task or or some other you know very standard task, you know like a trail making task or or just looking at like the smoothness of the trajectory, that might not necessarily predict their ability to actually create these letters and put the emphasis where the emphasis is, right? Like the standard uh -huh. motor task might not be able to capture the nuance and the ability to yeah. produce these complex uh -huh. patterns. Yeah, but again, you know, I'm not criticizing those, you know, studies. Yeah, of so course, of course, of course. Yeah, they have, you know, certain, Yeah, they reveal certain reality, yes. certain facts about the, the development. Right, right, right. There are uh, something that, you know. Uh, right, right. Cannot be addressed, right? Right. There's something. There's something more nuanced and, and complex mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in 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 these uh, you know real life motor skills, right? For sure. Yeah. Right. So so uh, so Naraka, going back to you know the ecological approach and to Gibson. So you wrote a chapter in you know our, our recent book uh, on Gibson, uh, where you uh, went to the archives uh, at Cornell to look through mm -hmm. Gibson's uh, you know. Uh, notes and letters uh, uh, in various contexts, and you produce uh, this very nice thesis. Could you come back to Gibson a little, little you know, provide a little bit of overview over of the ecological approach which you got from his notes, and then come back, you know, again from there to to your work on stone napping and uh, and handwriting and spoon views. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so you, you want me to talk about Gibson, huh? Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, a little yeah. recap, recap of Gibson, and especially from from the perspective of your, because you have done a really you know thorough reading of Gibson's uh, archives, which generally are not available, you know, uh, in in popular readings. So uh, a, a recap of those, you know, from your experience. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah so if you go to uh, you know Cornell University, Cornell, yeah. there are. Um, uh, Library uh, called uh, I think rare and Man uh, rare manuscripts uh, library or something, and they keep uh, about fifteen boxes of Gibson's manuscript uh, left in I think his his office and at his home, and it's ordered chrono chronologically, and you can kind of trace the, the development of Gibson's ideas. And and also also there are lots of letters uh, between like for example like Alec Nicer and also he often wrote to the philosopher Norman Malcolm and there are lots of you know letters and also of course the the those people who um, you know. Followed Gibson's approach, you know, Mike Turvey, Bill Mays, and yeah. Bob Shook. You can find, you know, exchange between them and stuff. And so the way Gibson, I think, wrote his books and probably the papers, he sort of um, uh, kind of writes memos of the points he wants to discuss, so which is available in, like, you know, Purple Peril. Which is the his seminar notes? Um, I think it's it's available on the web. So he has certain you know memos of his questions and topics, and which you can you know see it how it develops to the chapter of the ecological approach to perception, action, and stuff. Uh, ecological approach to you know visual perception. Yeah. 
And one of the very um, late memoirs, so uh, like 1978 or 79, there are a series of um, notes on what he called encounters. So he means encounters. Um, so he, he, he was saying that we need theory of controlling encounters with the environment. Yeah. So, uh, which is related to the the chapter of locomotion and manipulation in the, the ecological approach to visual perception. So where he talks about how we uh, prospectively uh, control the encounters okay. with uh, yeah the environment. And that's a very interesting part of um, sort of Gibson's notes in Cornell University. Uh, it's so, for example, Elena Gibson in he in her uh, book of called Perceiving Affordances, I think she recollects that the Gibson had lots of notes in his own copy of uh, the ecological approach of visual perception. Lots of notes in the, the chapter of locomotion and oh, manipulation. So after he wrote the book, in his own book, he yeah. had notes. Yeah, yeah. So he had lots of notes in the chapter of locomotion and manipulation. Yeah. So he was really um, um, sort of developing his ideas towards the the control of action right yeah e even after the book was written i mean yeah uh -huh. right yeah so so, so if, you, if you if you think about it you know it's pretty interesting so in the in the long scale of things it's a very similar behavior right like when we for instance we start with a lump of clay and we kind of shape it towards the final pot right uh, the same way if you if you think about it you know develop developing a theory over over a lifetime or a thesis right. over a lifetime it's a very similar process right where these interactions with different individuals are very similar right. to for instance a feedback or or interactions with the environment or the object you find while you are making that pot in like you know within a few hours uh, span of time yeah yeah and it's very interesting to uh, follow the kind of processes you know right. that that you know led to the end, end product right oh. so 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 how does uh, like ha, how how has your reading of gibson influenced your approach towards uh you know your experimental studies yeah for example you you talked about stone napping yeah so the i had the you know i, I was fortunate to work with uh, uh, Blonde in Brill. Uh, she she is a kind of uh, she works in between like anthropology, psychology, archaeology, and stuff. And I was fortunate to work with Blonde in Brill uh, in the project that looked into the the sort of um, skill of stone napping in you know archaeological records and stuff. Yeah. So. The, the one of the puzzle um, of like very really early stone napping is that so um, the napper seems to have anticipated what kind of flakes uh, so for example if you have uh, the the you know the stone and if you hit some part some part of stone will break and you know break and break. flake yeah. will come off yeah will chip away yes and, but it's very difficult to control exactly what which part of the the stone will come off and stuff yeah but the archaeological records suggest that um they were really uh controlling the in a prospective manner which yeah. part of the, the stone you know flake will come off and stuff so one of the the uh, question of our study was how the makers of stone tools 
kind of anticipated the outcome of their own strike. Yeah. Given to the 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 storm. Right. So, and and we found that the there's certain um, regularity between the, for example, um, if you have a stone and you have to hit the, you know, close to the edge to get the, you know, flakes. Yeah. But this, so the how far the the striking location is from the edge and also the angle of the edge yeah which they also uh, they you know they um together determine the the shape yeah. of the flake that will come off right but you know it, novices do not attend to these relations for example you know expert like replica yeah. craftsmen they they um uh, attend to certain regularities that exist in the the striking location and the, the end the product. Yeah. So they kind of perceive the something that is inevitable. Right. You know, if you you know hit here, something yeah. inevitably happens. Yeah. That's what they are you know perceiving. So it's it's anticipation of the future, but it's actually the perception of inevitability you know what i mean so perception something of inability yeah inevitability yeah, in, yeah. yeah something that is perceiving something that is inevitable yeah. is um actually anticipating the future right. so yeah so this is very close to you know gibsonian ideas so um you don't really have to have the, you know, you know, have the clear cut um, division between anticipation and perception. But it's I kind see, of I see, I, I, I yeah. see. A very, very, very important point. So your current perception is not just current perception, but it actually also carries something about the the future, or yeah, it yeah. Uh, or it fixes. It basically canalizes future as well. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, yeah. No, so, that, 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 that makes sense. And you said that you, you, you mentioned in, your, in Gibson's notes that Gibson uh -huh. was talking about how uh, the future is prospective uh, with regard to actions. Uh huh. Yeah, he was talking about uh, anticipating something. Yeah, is um, actually uh, can be done by you know um, perceiving. Uh, for example, some kind of event. Yeah, cast the shadows before it happens. Right, you know yes. something. Uh, Preceding that certain event, there's some kind of um, preliminary events that happens that can happen. You know, if you perceive yeah, yeah. this, you know, uh, preliminary events, yeah. you can perceive the future, right? Right. So, so yeah, yeah. there's a there's a there's a structure to it. Uh -huh. So it's not like um, imagination or something, but it's it's actually a perception of something that's related to the future event. Right. Yeah, and Gibson was you know, so in the in his notes, there's a note called "What is it to expect?" Yeah, and he is talking about uh, this kind of thing, you know, how expecting something cannot be really separated from perceiving that something is going to happen. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. No, it, it makes it makes complete sense. Complete sense. Could you also elaborate this uh, in the context of uh, uh, some other skills like pottery, for instance, or 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 spoon use, or uh, or handwriting? Okay. okay. Um. Yeah. So you, you mean the anticipation and stuff? Yes. 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 Mm. So maybe pottery, yeah. So, 
So on, on the one hand, we found that the, every individual kind of flexibly adjust the process of uh, you know, shaping the, the vessels to reach certain um, certain model, you know, patterns. Right. right. Yeah, but uh, this is this hasn't been pub published. But um, we found that there are several patterns of doing this, and so some potters. Uh, for example, if you make different vessels, different shape of vessels, yeah, some potters uh, start from, you know, so some starts some some potters uh, prefer to start from uh, different initial condition of you know clay, yeah, but there are other potters who uses um, exactly the same initial uh kind of condition of clay like initial shape of the the clay oh even so though they, even though the end result is different yeah. right 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 so it's like a so it's like a stem cell you know yeah yeah you have certain uh very flexible shape using the you know so from which all different shapes diverge right so some pot, so what uh Potter's actually perceiving is not the not just the the you know following certain step, but they kind of uh, they're adjusting the what they're doing now in relation to uh, what's happening in the future, right? Right. So so, so some some potters choose to have very um, sort of very sh the shape that can be flexibly turned into different you know shapes but some potters uses uh, a different st strategy you know they and and is there any difference between novice novices and uh, experts in, um, in this? No, actually, we haven't uh, looked at novices for this study. We only looked at the experts. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know. There, there are elements of uh, anticipation right. in, yeah, in pottery skill as well. So, uh, so let me play devil's advocate and, uh, you know, let me argue that, so... I mean, it's an interesting point about prospection and perception carrying, uh, you know, an inevitability about the future, especially when you couple that perception with action, right? Uh, but it, like one can say that that is a truism and there's nothing interesting about it, right? That yes, but you know, when you act, you change, you change the future, right? And the way you will act on things, of course, it will determine the future. So... So, so why are we ecological psychologists get so excited about looking at this loop compared to, you know, uh, you know, other people who might not find this interesting or, or, or that fascinating, let's say. Yes. Yeah, so, um, prospective control itself yeah. is, you know, um, not the interesting part, maybe. So the, probably the presence of information that is more interesting. Okay. For example, uh, for stone napping, yeah. um, the relation between the, the potential striking point and the edge, the distance to the edge yeah. and the angle of the edge, they are all visible and under control of the napper. So you can look, look for the, the kind of information that ends up in the certain shape of flake that can end up in some right. you know shape of flake. So, so so yeah. Yep. So can it be so, compared to the information, for instance, with a with a with a tau model, for instance, you know, of catching a fly ball, can this information be compared one to one to that information or that kind of an invariant, for instance, in the case of optic flow? Or or uh, are we talking so, about different things? So 
so we didn't succeed in you know the, the sort of mathematical formulation of the information yeah. like tau but i think it's analogous to something like tau so if you are attuned to certain regularity of the shape of the the stone yeah you can actually control the future uh flake right. and so one way to look at this you know skill for, for example one yeah one way to look at this kind of like anticipation skill you you can of course argue that that's a skill of certain you know uh prediction or you know you know or, i don't know it's mental time travel or something but if there's information that's that's you know of course perception plays a role you know? right Right in in anticipation, right. it's not just the mental time travel. It's it's detection of information that has relevance to the future event, right? Right, right. So it's a different way of looking at it. But I do not deny, you know, something like mental time travel plays a role in this, you know, skill. But I don't know. Um, but still, we can. So for for the stone mapping skill, we tested with also with novices, and novices could not uh, use this kind of you know regularity. So we the, what we did is we asked the participants to draw the outline of the future flakes that could oh I uh, see come, yeah that could come off with their own strike yeah. right yeah so so you can see what what they are attending before the strike. Yeah, and it was clear that the novices were trying to, you know, novices were not focusing their attention on this, you know, regularity uh, that exists in, in the, the this, you know, what, what is called conchoidal fracture, right. and so they are trying to uh, detach a flake that is sort of impossible in terms of mechanics. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, so does it mean that if you have to, I mean, so does it have implications for training, for instance? So, does it mean that if you will make a a learner directed towards that particular, you know, variables about the stone, uh, will they improve faster or will they be able to learn stone mapping? So, is it is it actually a predictor of learning or is it just a difference between, you know? Can it mediate learning, or is it a difference that we see between, you know, novices and experts? Um, so I, I think, but the so I think it's you know knowing the principle yeah. helps you learn the the you know mapping faster. But the thing is that, um, for example, I know certain you know relation is important in you know stone napping but i still cannot you know uh, control the the flaking events as experts do so there are very um i don't know if it's perhaps because what i just described is not all but there yeah. are some other factors involved in the 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 uh, making the flake, making of the flakes. Um, so I, I don't know if I think it helps to you know, right? Uh, learn faster, but it, it's just it, one yes. It can be a it can be a cheat code. Yeah, maybe, but yeah, uh, yeah. So if you ask the the stone nappers, yeah, most of the time they can uh, sort of describe the relation between you know the so 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 when have you noticed that like when when actual nappers try to teach some novices do they also point to this particular uh you know principle or regularity or is it that we scientists observe this regularity but stone nappers are not explicitly aware of this regularity uh i think uh, so for example some nappers when we ask when we asked how how you do it, yeah, he just said you just just hold the stone and hit it, something like that. So yeah. very, 
he did not, you know, um, very, he knows how to make flakes, but he did not uh, verbalize the, yeah. the principle. But so I think there are something that um, only scientists yeah. uh, kind yeah. of revealed in the in the relation. But some nappers are very uh, aware of what what he you know yeah. what he's doing. Yeah. So for the viewers, I would remind that stone napping is an extremely difficult skill. So and the stone which is used for making stone tools, for instance, uh, obsidian, is one of the sharpest uh, you know elements uh, on on the planet. I mean, uh, a blade of obsidian is much more. Uh, are dangerous and you know can cut skin and muscles compared to any you know for instance razor blade we use and there are very few individuals who can actually nap stones for instance uh, if you're in the united states it's very hard to find a double digit you know people in double digits who can actually uh, make really nice uh, stone tools uh, there are very very few individuals who can use it very skillfully and this is a skill which almost all our ancestors used to have right like if we look at uh, early hominids uh, a large population of early hominids were probably good at making these stone tools. Yeah, that's a. Uh, um, I'm not sure if you know all no. the hominids, but the, the so uh, and also one thing, not just obsidian, but you know there are flints Others, and basalt. Yes, uh, yeah, other other stones as well. And so the problem they faced, the early hominids faced. Was you know was hypothesized that you know if you want to cut something, if you want to you know cut bones or anything, if you want to cut something, there are very um, it's very difficult to find something to you know yes natural something that is natural which can cut something yeah because there was no metal for instance yeah there were no right right there was right. no copper there was no brass there was no iron. Yes, right, and certain stones uh, has specific uh, fracture mechanics that yes. yield very sharp edges, which is the mechanics called conchoidal fracture. Yeah, and certain stones have these properties. Yeah, and early hominins seem to have used these properties to make something to cut, you know, bone and right. stuff. Right, right. Okay. Right, exactly. Yeah, so so the availability of that particular those particular stones with uh with kind of an anisotropy as well as uh, uh a specific you know fracture mechanics was very necessary yep, yep. for this. Right, mm -hmm. but but am 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 I right about predicting that you know so uh, you know within a uh, a particular species of hominids, uh, we had a larger proportion of individuals being able to nap stones compared to, for instance, what, you know, like among us right now, it, it was a dominant skill, right? At dominant cultural skill at some point, right? Despite it being a very difficult one. Yeah, uh, so th there are evidence that the, you know, they were making stone tools. Yeah. And which is, uh, and they are really good uh, at, you know, uh, making st stone tools, which is, for example, uh, very like two two point like three or four million years ago. Right. There's evidence that the the sequence of uh, so so the material stone material is kind of precious, right? And they were. Um, not to waste, you know, the material. Right, right. Producing as many flakes as possible, right? So to do this, you need to uh, control the, 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 you know. Right. You cannot just break the stone. You, you can precisely control the process of, right. you know, Because a wrong, a wrong, you know, uh, strike can, you know, make the piece break into two and you might not be able to make any, you know, big tool out right, of it. Right. So when you look at actually old one access, for instance, I have tried nabbing myself. There's no way I can produce, you know, a good old one tool, which was like made yeah. a couple of million years back. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, it's the skill is very difficult. It's very difficult. I agree. Uh -huh. with you. 
So, Professor Nanakao, uh, so how does all this work that you have done, you know, from the ecosec perspective, relates to your uh, uh, your current job, for instance, being in the Department of Education? So, how does well, it translate all, like, or does it to uh, pedagogy and you know uh, other aspects of teaching? So, I do not really, um, you know, teach ped pedagogy and stuff. I, yeah. but you know, I study the development of skills and and also you mentioned that the i study the real world skills yeah which is my one of my emphasis so you know it's one you know it's good to do the you know laboratory experiment to control everything and you know find out the the exact you know mechanism and stuff but on the other hand you have to uh, you have to investigate what's what what what's actually going on in real life right so yeah. my emphasis on the real world skill is i think related to what i do in my institute so it's not just the the uh, it's not just the mechanism, but the the sort of um, I would like to take into account the, the real world context, the complexity of the real world context. Yeah, yeah, um, to understand the skills. But but do you think that ecopsych has a lot more potential or or an enormous potential uh, in how we, for instance, you know how we uh conceptualize learning disabilities for instance you know dyslexia for instance you know when it comes to writing and reading and we already know work by eleanor gibson about perceptual differentiation about alphabets right where she argues that we don't learn alphabets by making representations of alphabets but being able to differentiate you know perpetually perceptually you know uh you know with learning uh, and the whole idea of direct perception about basically the confluence of direct perception and you know uh, and differential learning so so does ecopsych holds a higher ground in terms of its ability to translate it to actually again reframing these disorders you know coming up with ways to enhance the training of you know kids who have these kind of disorders or in general you know uh, improvement of skill especially under compromised situations I think so. I think so. Yeah, because, uh, for example, so, um, like, um, for example, you, you do rehabilitation, like, uh, you know, yeah. you, you you're interested in like rehabilitation and stuff, right? So, right. if you want to, um, sort of relearn the after some kind of um, damage, if you want to relearn how to walk and stuff um it's more it makes more sense to uh how you harnesses the the properties of the environment in such a way to you know uh, make the 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 walking possible so uh but you know so what you do is really coupling with the environment like any yeah, yeah. skills what you do is really you, you have to kind of yeah attune you, to certain you you have to more uh cleverly exploit the environmental resources yeah compared to you know other situations uh -huh. and you have to recognize what resources are available to right. uh, you know understand. Which, which which also means that you know, the life of, you know, for instance, somebody with certain kind of disability can be much made much better if you change the environment rather than, or shape the environment differently rather than actually, you know, asking them to uh, learn some skills, right? Or 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 to change the part of the body. Uh, what is it? So, so, for, for, so, so for instance, the reshaping the environment, uh, uh, reshaping the environment in ways which provides more resources to a compromised system compared to 
you know, putting more load on the cognitive system itself. Yeah, so yeah, it's, I, uh, I'm not sure if I understood your question. It's, so it's really tuning of your system into the, the particular aspects of the functional aspects of the environment that are relevant to the task at hand. And this kind of framework, uh, I think is useful in the, you know, like for example, rehabilitation or, you know, things like that. So for example, I study braille reading. Yeah. In blind children. So if you think about uh, reading braille, um, it's it's really about uh, learning to differentiate uh, certain patterns and how you enhance the the you know ability to differentiate. Yeah. So, right. so it's not about memorizing the patterns and stuff, but it's it's actually the the, the acquiring the movement that best differentiates different, you know, dot patterns. Letters, yes. Yeah. Right. So this kind of perspective I think helps learner to learn uh, uh you know the, for example braille reading skills and stuff. Uh, I I remember you have a paper on Braille, right? Yeah. So 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 what did you exactly do in that uh, study? Oh, uh, in, in the Braille learning yeah. study. Yeah. So I looked at uh, children who are learning Braille, Braille reading. Yeah. And I attached this sensor to the finger, reading finger, and look at the movement of Braille reading. So it has been um, argued that the, you know, in back in like 1990s, you have to move, uh, it was said that you have to move your finger in a constant velocity to convert the spatial pattern into yeah. the temporal pattern, right? So yeah. you have to, it was said that you have to move your fingers as um, constant yeah. velocity as possible to convert the spatial pattern to the the to the letters pattern. and the yeah yeah. But if you look at the the braille fingers of braille readers, it's far from constant. You know, they they are moving their fingers in a very complex manner. Uh, fluctuates. You know, the velocity fluctuates a lot. So I looked at the, the um, movement of the reading finger and we found that the, um, so we characterized the, the um, movement in terms of two variables. One is the, the so multi-scale temporal relationship. So yeah. it's, I did like the gender fluctuate analysis. And the other one is the posture of the finger relative to the paper. Okay. And so the fast readers, faster, you know, the, the children who can read very fast has more, um, more long range, you know, strong long range temporal correlation in okay. the, the movement of yeah. the finger. And also, but, we also found that they, so this is like the movement of the, the translational movement of the finger. Yeah. But if you look at the, the posture of the finger, uh, the fast readers tend to maintain the posture of the finger in relation to the, the paper surface, okay. more, or less more or less invariant. While yeah. the, the you know novice readers they change uh, the orientation yeah. while reading a lot, and um, and movements tends to be more uh, more close to um, random uh, fluctuation. So the 
what um, our study showed was that the fluctuation of the you know movement, you know, velocity of reading movement actually contributes yeah. or is actually related to the reading performance of the braille. It's not just the noise. It's just noise, yeah, and, especially the temporal yeah, structure. Yeah. Yeah. And also we so that certain um you know posture uh, postural invariance they they kind of you know maintain also the posture to enhance the the uh detection of the the dot pattern right is you know develops during the course of you know braille learning right yeah so th that's a two find th these are the you know the two findings no it's 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 actually very interesting Co counter to the idea of you know simple representations where right uh, no matter you know the context or how embedded the movement is you know within within the longer movement uh, right. if it basically sensory reception of a particular letter it should just get registered by that particular alphabet right mm -hmm. however what it shows is that it's not just that it's it's even the random variation or uh, temporally correlated variation has a role to play there. So it's not just, you know, representation itself cannot explain the brain reading skills. Yeah. Right, right. And also, I think it's related to the, the structure of uh, language. Yeah. So you have to be attuned to different uh, scales. So for example, the scale of, you know, sentences and scale of words. And scale of the the, so, the pattern notes and stuff. So uh, you have to explore different. Right. right. Yeah. I I'm not sure whether you have done, but probably it would be very interesting to look at when you actually have predictable sentences. For instance, uh, a boy is sitting on a tree, where a boy, you know, it's very likely that it would be is right after that, uh, and look at the patterns then compared to a abrupt, uh, you know, uh, absurd sentence. You know. Uh, you know the the boy goat dance uh, tree, you know side into well okay something like that. So whether the prospection of the language, the structure of the language itself, interacts with uh, you know the reading skills because uh, you have certain predictable predictable structure which is contributing towards the long range correlations within movements, right? Yeah, yeah. So that that's an interesting point. So that's one of the things actually what we are doing right now. Yeah. So we have the phone book. So it's uh, the, you know, the phone numbers, numbers have, you know, you cannot predict the phone you number. Predict, right? Yeah. Right. right, right. So I'm actually now um, trying to characterize the pattern of movement, reading different kind of material. Right. Yeah. So how uh, the pattern of movement differs when you're reading something really um, like unpredict unpredictable string of numbers or some kind of sentences or stuff. And also what's interesting is that, uh, um, for example, roboticists yeah. uh, have um, kind of made the robot who can, which can read uh, yeah. Braille and their algorithm of the movement, one of the the study I found is that the so when the pattern get ambiguous, yeah, it, it, the algo the algorithm is that one when the pattern gets ambiguous, it slows down the movement, right? To you know explore, but right when I looked at the the actual human, yeah, it it becomes faster reading so. What you do is when it gets ambiguous, it this starts like very yeah. tiny this kind of movement. Yeah, so yeah. Instead of slowing down, they they move uh, micro. Uh, how do you say? So, micro... so small scale interactions. So yeah, basically, yeah. you know, like finer scale movements uh, increase uh -huh. basically. Yeah. So yeah. it's totally different, and so. Uh, to to, an, to one can argue that actually they are using kind of resonance or. They are using uh, uh, you are they are utilizing fluctuations to differentiate. Yeah, I think so. You you need kind of fluctuation to sort of get clarity of the information. Yeah. Right. 
Uh -huh. So that's very different from what roboticists think. And, and yeah. I think it's part of the, the um, sort of reason why we see like long range, long range temporal okay. correlation because you, the micro scale uh, fluctuation is required to um, resolve ambiguity of the pattern while you have to attend to other scales of um, sort of uh, pattern of dots uh, in, you know, bigger right, right, scale. Right, 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 so, right. Which very much speaks to, you know, my own work and in general, that how very subtle fluctuations and posture are enabling, you know, the enable, they enable us to perform tasks much more dexterously compared to actually becoming a nuisance or a noise, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it might be very different in the case of a robot where, you know, fluctuations of the body might actually create distortions, especially when they're too fast uh, compared to, you know, uh, things happening uh, at the level of the eye. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that, that's very interesting. So, Professor Nanaka, uh, uh, very interesting stuff happening to your lab. Uh, I have been following your work since the uh, you know, first time I encountered when I entered into, into the realm of, uh, you know, EcoSec. Uh, and uh, we have met at conferences. I am not coming to ICP yet this year, but okay. hopefully, uh, by the way, uh, it's possible that ICPA uh, 2026, uh, we would be hosting it at University of Nebraska, Omaha. Uh, oh, really? It it seems to be the case. We'll see how it goes, uh -huh. but uh, that's the plan is currently. So if that's the case, uh, I'll definitely see you in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So, uh, Professor Naka, it was great talking to you. If you have any end notes uh, or any reading recommendations uh, for uh, for our viewers, especially uh, about Gibson and EcoPsych, of course, I'll put uh, links to your work in the description of this video. Okay. So, um, uh, reading recommendation. So. Um... So right now I'm working on basically like two things. One is the, the sort of attunement um, of uh, sort of during skill development. And the other is I'm trying to find uh, ways to address the issue of the medium of information. So for example, like tensegrity ideas yes. uh, um, put forward by Turvey and Fonseca. So what, what kind of, uh, what is the condition of uh, medium, material medium that makes possible to uh, provide uh, information about the, the you know, aspect of the environment, the aspects of the, the yourself and stuff. Yeah. So, and I think this, kind of medium stuff is related to lots of different disciplines. Right. And so uh, the one I'm interested in right now, is, so I looked at this, you know, uh, beyond the phrenology, uh, the, the Bill Warren's uh, interview. Yeah. And he talked about reservoir network. Yes. Yeah. And there's a, a branch of uh, sort of reservoir network called physical reservoir computing. Yes, it's a very active makes, branch in computing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, which uses some some kind of you know water or any you know physical material. Yeah. To uh, for information processing and stuff, but yeah. I think this is very much related to yeah. So. It's a very interesting concept that the physical, the structure of the physical material itself uh, can yield, it doesn't compute, but at the same time, it can solve those computational problems that are embedded within the material structure itself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it works as a, as a way of computing beyond, you know, Boolean algebra, for instance, uh, which is very much parallel to the whole idea of tensegrity and how, you know, uh, a very high dimensional tensegrity network, network structure of the body itself you know, can provide a lot of information and allow us to perceive the environment to a large extent, especially haptically. And you have people like Patrick Cape, for instance, who have argued 
the tensegrity is the medium for all perception even the you know eye in the eyeball is actually controlled by a tensegrity mechanism so uh, tensegrity is behind almost every kind of perception yeah yeah so um, yeah i do not know everything is tensegrity or not but i, I i'm sure that the, the, there are kind of um, underlying principle yeah. of the medium that yeah. makes available information for example air is a medium for you know sound and light and stuff and the body is you know the medium of you know electricity or i, I don't know the the, the tens tensile network and everything so there are certain um things uh, certain uh, material things that makes available the opportunity for uh uh, agent to explore the information and that's an important um, kind of development potential development of ecological psychology I think definitely yeah uh, it's a little hard to study though I will say uh, I know yeah I know it's it's very difficult right? yeah it's 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 much easier to you know like you can of course look at statistical effects uh, created by a tensegrity kind of medium but at the same time uh, to be able to deal with it in a very mechanistic fashion, the way we do mechanistic neuroscience or psychology is a little challenging, at least at this point. Yeah. 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 It, it's very difficult. So I'm thinking of um, if we can, you know, collaborate with roboticists and stuff, you know, you know, there are a branch of robotics called soft robotics, yeah. which considers, uh, which takes into account the the material character characteristics yeah. of the body yeah. for the, the kind of information that can be used for the right. agents. So I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of the you know way to kind of develop in this direction as well. Well, very interesting. I look forward to you know having any developments from your side on that. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thanks so much, uh, Professor Nonaka. It was a pleasure talking to you getting to know Thank about you. your interesting work and uh, hopefully uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you again. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.